And now, please welcome our founder and CEO, Robert Refkin. Hello, Compass! <laughs> and happy 10 year anniversary. <laughs> now, you may think on our 10 year anniversary, I'm going to talk about how we're the number one brokerage firm in the country, <laughs> or how we're a Fortune 500 company or how we sell and lease a home on average once per minute. But that's what we are. Today I want to talk about who we are. I want to share the arc of Compass and what it is at the most important points that let us get to where we are today and what's going to allow us to get to where we're going to be tomorrow. Now, I love all of our eight Compass entrepreneurship principles, but there's one of them that stands above all the others as your most unique superpower, the defining characteristic of an entrepreneur. All right, you're... <laughs> you got it. Uh, bounce back with passion. All right, you got it. <laughs> Now, you're so good at bouncing back that you take it for granted. Most people do not have the capacity to deal with failure and still move forward. But you as the agent, the real estate professional, you have the ability to have, to knock on 10 doors and really deal with rejection every single time. No, 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 no. And do the 11th as if that just didn't happen. I mean. It's almost a little crazy. <laughs> now, at Compass, we are a bounce back with passion story. In our 10 years, we have launched over 500 offices. But you know, in every market, competitors said we were going to fail, every single one. In our 10 years, the real estate press has written the exact same story, just in different ways, every single year saying Compass is gonna fail. I remember when I was just a 34-year-old kid, one year into founding Compass, I hired one of our first top agents from Upper East Side. We're supposed to meet on the ground floor on her first day and she comes to me in tears, saying, Robert, I, I just can't come. I'm like, why, what happened? She said that, the CEO of her company, one of the largest in the industry, had just told her that I was anti-Semitic. Oh. <laughs> so I said, look, first of all, I'm Jewish. <laughs> But what if I wasn't Jewish? <laughs> she, she wouldn't have, she may not have come. That's just giving you a glimpse of the negativity that this company has been thrown at under the scenes. Fortunately, I was trained by one of the best entrepreneurs I know on how to deal with these kinds of situations. My mom. <laughs> Man, she's on brand. You're black and white. I like that. <laughs> Knows the compass colors. Uh, <laughs> um, look, my mom has lived an entrepreneurial life. Immigrant from Israel, entrepreneurial journey. Raised me as a single mother. That's an entrepreneurial path. She was as a young girl, didn't have a good relationship with her father. I think uh, as I've gotten to know 
is really the source is that she was too independent and strong-minded as a young, wonderful girl. When I was born, my grandparents disowned her for having a black child. But it gets worse. When she found out that her dad died, he gave her a hundred dollars because he wanted her to know that on his deathbed that he wanted her to fail. But she didn't fail. Not my mom. <laughs> As a single mother in Berkeley, California, right? By the way, from New York, she went to Woodstock. You know, she's the kind of person that I went to the real Woodstock, right? right? But where would you go if you want to search for being your authentic self and being accepted? She went to Berkeley. And she created a, in our little house a preschool called the Unicorn School, right? Entrepreneurs were a positive people. And it allowed her to take care of me and make money at the same time. And when I graduated preschool and I went to pre-K, she worked at the Jewish Community Center of the Greater East Bay so she could make money and take care of me at the same time. And then a woman named Michael Kraft, the first sales manager, woman sales manager of New York Life Insurance said, Ruth, you know all these Jews that just had kids, you should sell them life insurance. <laughs> smart. <laughs> and so she did that as a life insurance agent for the first half of my life. In the second half, she's been a real estate agent. You may have seen some of her digital newsletters. <laughs> Price improvement. <laughs> but I remember her going to these big houses when I was just a young person and someone in there would make her feel less than. I remember her coming home in tears because there was a check that she was really counting on that didn't come through. But I also remember how when my sixth grade teacher said that I was a bad kid and I should not be at that school, she went in there and told that teacher <laughs> a thing or two. <laughs> And she took me out, we applied for a scholarship, and we went to a different school. And I remember when I was in 12th grade, my high school college admissions counselor said, Robert, don't even apply to your dream school, Columbia University. You'll never get in, you don't have the grades. It wouldn't be worth the application fee, you'll be throwing the money in the garbage. But you don't say that to an entrepreneur's son. <laughs> So she said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go out to New York. I was a DJ at the time. Give him, give the, the admissions officer your business card. And then you'll fax all the information about your DJ business and you'll write a handwritten note, a couple of them. And we applied early and guess what? We got in. <laughs> But notice, I say, we got in. That's what it felt like. <clears throat> Look, I thought today, on our 10 year anniversary, in this bounce back with passion company, I could share with you my lowest low and my highest high at Compass. The story of how on April 2nd, the day after the IPO, was supposed to happen, I found myself in a shower on the floor crying in tears. The real story of how the IPO almost never happened. You want to hear it? Yeah. All right. <laughs> it all started two years ago today. <laughs> At that time, Redfin was approaching $96 a share. 
Now it's four. Zillow was in the 200s. Now it's in the 20s. Open door was above 35, and now it's two. But all was good back then. <laughs> and investment bankers started calling and saying, you should go public. I said, why? I like being private. They said, going public isn't about selling shares. It's about raising money so you have more money in your bank account as a company for good times or for bad. And so I obsessed about opportunity, move fast, and we set a date for April 2nd, April 1st. Yeah, and the week before is a, what we call the road show. The road show is where you meet the final group of investors who are gonna invest money into the IPO. So the week before, I wake up in the morning, I'm all optimistic, all inspired. So much work has gone into this moment. I drink uh, an espresso. My wife comes in, gives me a kiss on the cheek, and she says, go get him, honey. And I say, I got you. <laughs> and then I get in the video conference. It was a great first day. The next day, <laughs> great day. Next day, great morning. Two o'clock, I meet with an investor, one of the best in the world, who just said, a few months before that they wanted to invest in our IPO. And he says, Robert, I'm really sorry, but something is happening right now. You're gonna read about it in the press. It is a global event in the investment world, one of the largest companies that invest in companies just like you. Fast growing, technology powered businesses is going bankrupt and they're selling all their investments 20, 30% off in block trades. I'm sorry, I have to go. And so I call one of our advisors, I'm like, what's going on? And he says, if I had to write a fictional story of how bad things could get in the middle of an IPO, I could not have imagined this. This is like an asteroid hitting the earth. Let me put this in real estate terms. You have a life-changing listing. You're gonna list it tomorrow. It's gonna to have an international press. You've been preparing for 10 years. You've already met a bunch of the buyers. They're just waiting for you to list. But then the day before, a discreet billionaire family that you've never even heard the name of, they go bankrupt. And they own a bunch of competitive properties just like yours and they're listing them all and selling them at 20 to 30% off over the next week. What would that do to your listing? What would that do to the demand or price of your property? Asteroid hitting the earth. So I call another advisor and I say, so what do we do? What's the next step? Entrepreneurs, we always think about how we get to the next place. We go back and forth, back and forth, nothing positive. The question was asked, should we consider polling the IPO? I was like, what does that mean? So we'll come back in a week when this is over or, or like a month? <laughs> There's a, a laugh, no, 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 you have to come back in a year. A, a year? But what if the market isn't good in a year? <laughs> <laughs> like all these people, we are counting on it. So that night, I go to dinner, it's Friday night, with my wife, my oldest, Raya, Ruby, and Little River. We're at Fogo de Chao. Anyone know Fogo de Chao, the Brazilians? There's uh, green when you're eating, red when you're not. I was on red the entire time. I lost my appetite. It's supposed to be a celebratory dinner. I'm telling my wife, oh my God, you don't understand. This is so stressful. There's 30,000 people counting on this. There's so much pressure. I don't, I don't know what to do. This is bigger than me. This is a global thing. I, I don't know what to do. I look outside at the window 
and she just sees me just dozing off. And um, it, feel, it felt like that blurry, blurry moment in the middle of a movie where it's like a blurry tunnel you're looking straight through. And she asked me, she says, she's never seen me like that. I've never felt that bad before. I didn't know where to go. And she says, are you okay? And I told her, I, I just feel like curling up in the corner and crying. And then, you know what she says? We can do that if that's what you need. We can do that. How sweet is that? <laughs> Don't. <laughs> But don't worry, you were not in the corner if I get a child crying. No. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> but that was the only time in my life where I had no hope. That was my lowest low. The next day, I wake up and I call one of our advisors and say, what do we do? There must be something we can do. There's always something you can do. He said, Robert, how much do you have as a family? You should sell every dollar you have and invest it in the IPO. It will show investors that you're committed to the company, that you believe in the company. So he asked how much we had. We had a little over $17 million. And he said to sell it all over the next 24 hours and commit it to the IPO. So I called my wife. <laughs> I, I, say, I say, honey, I know what we have to do. We need to sell everything as a family and invest it in the IPO. There are 30,000 people that have put their blood, sweat, and tears into this company. They have invested their own money in this company. We need to go all in. And so we did. She said yes. <laughs> the next day was better. Because of the commitment I made, we're getting more traction in the final book of investors. And then there's another day, it's getting a little better, but someone says, Robert, I want you to know this may not happen. I want you to prepare yourself. This may not happen. The final night before the final day, which where the New York Stock Exchange is supposed to drop the flag at four o'clock, I'm thinking, what else can I do? Like, I gotta do everything I can. You leave everything on the table, no regrets. So I call the most senior executive at the most prestigious, and well-renowned investment bank in the world. And I say, I need you to deliver the entire power of your firm to this IPO. He says something. <laughs> I say something. <laughs> he says something. I say something. And he says one more thing where I can tell I don't have another I don't have much more that this conversation is going to allow for. And so I think, what do I say to put everything out there? I said, when you go to sleep tonight, I want you to think about the 30,000 agents and their families. I want you to see the images of their faces because they are all counting on you and your firm to make this happen. <laughs> <laughs> The next day was the last day, and it's better. At four o'clock, the New York Stock Exchange is supposed to drop the flag. The bankers are working even more than ever before to get this done, and New York Stock Exchange calls at four o'clock. Are you ready to drop the flag? You look at the final book of investors, it's not done yet. No, we're not, we're not ready yet, just we'll, we'll call you, we'll let you know. 
they call at five. We look at the final book of investors. It's not done yet. No, we're, 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 not, we're not ready yet. They call at six. They call at seven. Look, should we tell people to go home? Like this, is this gonna happen? It, 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 it's seven o'clock. Everything is fine. <laughs> <laughs> Just stay where you are. <laughs> we will let you know. <laughs> 7.15, 7.30, we look at the book, it's done, boom, drop the flag, goes down to 7.30, the latest New York Stock Exchange history, and the next morning at 9.30, bing, your company IPOs and raises $450 million to invest in your company, the future of the agent. <laughs> Now, for many CEOs, that would have been their highest high. It was a $10 billion IPO, a top 100 IPO in the history of the United States. But uh, for me, the moment came the next day. I wake up in the morning, in two rooms over for me and my wife, she stays asleep, I take a shower. And I feel a lot lighter, <laughs> a lot happier, a lot more relieved. And just thinking about whatever, all the different challenges we had, all the different competitors that said all these things about how we'd feel over the years, and we just kept bouncing forward together. And out of nowhere, I see this scene of Rocky Balboa. Does anyone know the movie Rocky? <laughs> anyone from Philly here? <laughs> so I see this scene, and you don't get to choose your thoughts, they just come to you, of Rocky Balboa at the end, and he's like, Adrian, Adrian, you know, that amazing euphoric feeling. And then in about 20 seconds, I just fall on the floor, crying. Ugh. I, I cried so hard that I couldn't stand up. My legs were shivering, this fell. I tried as hard as I could, but I couldn't stand up. I cried so loud that my wife heard me two rooms away with earplugs in. <laughs> and so I want to share with you what I thought about in those moments. I saw an image of my mom. <laughs> At 77 years old, that beautiful smile that she portrays, just like all of you do on your social media, <laughs> in your marketing. But I know, just like her, behind those smiles, there's so many challenges. I know how hard you're trying to keep things working. So I see this image of her. Smiling, trying to prove her value to the world because as a young girl, her father didn't give her the love that she deserved. Mm. And thinking about all the challenges we went through through those many years, how all these men didn't give her the love that she so wanted. But also I thought about how she persevered and how hard she worked for me. And I thought about that image of her just taking me out of a school, which that was a pivotal moment. If she did not, I would not be here today. But she got me into a better school. And when that college counselor said he didn't believe in me, she's like, uh-uh, let's go. <laughs> and we got into Columbia. And how when I went to New York, she came with me and moved to New York. <laughs> and how she came with all those marathons and every one of those finish lines. How she helped write the first urban compass business plan. 
She's been there every step of the way. And I just thought, Mom, we did it. good in the world. Your company again, $10 billion company. But then August 2021, something happened. I heard a word that I had not heard in the context of the United States. I heard it with Venezuela. I heard it with Argentina, but not the United States in my lifetime. Inflation. And what I would soon realize <laughs> is that the Fed would be raising rates to such a level that companies would lose revenue and people would lose jobs. That was the goal. The Fed's mandate is not jobs, it's not company revenue, it's not the economy, it's not the stock market. It is 2% inflation, period. Everyone else is collateral damage. And so they raise the rates, to make sure that companies would lose revenue, people would lose jobs, and we would stop buying as much stuff, increasing inflation. But we as an industry, we're double impacted. Mortgage rates. In March, mortgage rates went up faster in one month than any time in the long history of this country. Fastest one month increase. And we saw the fastest one week increase in the first week of June. And then any, long, any moment in the long history of this country. We have gone from an all country 200 plus year low mortgage rates in January to a 20 plus year high in less than nine months. What we are living through is historic by any measure. They're going to write about this moment in textbooks and people are going to read about it in universities for generations to come. Now we are an optimistic people as entrepreneurs. <laughs> we like to believe things are always gonna get better. But there is a moment in June where I realized that hope cannot be a strategy. You need to plan for the worst and hope for the best. An investor calls me and says, Robert, I hope you're able to make the hard decision. I hope you can do what it takes. What he meant were layoffs. He then goes on to tell me how people don't believe founders can make the hard decisions because we're too emotionally wedded to what we built. We go back and forth, back and forth. He tells me how he thinks the Fed's gonna keep on raising rates and rates and rates. Remember at that time, we just broke six for the first time. Now we're almost seven and a half. And he said he thinks the Fed chair will tip the economy into recession. He then hangs up the phone by saying, good luck. <laughs> I gotta say, that was one of the scariest conversations I've ever had. Good luck? <laughs> no, 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 no. We've all worked way too hard to, to depend on luck. I'm gonna make the hard decisions. If the real estate market goes down 30%, shouldn't our expenses go down as well? I see all the agents bringing their expenses down. They should be more concerned if I don't do anything. So I made the hard decision. And it was a heartbreaking one, but it was the right one. Our technology team, as example, went from 1,500 people to 700. But here's where we are now. 700 people is still likely larger than every other traditional broker firm's technology team combined. It's larger than we were just two years ago. When you log in to compass.com and you put in your username and your password, what you're logging into took $900 million of cash to build. Is it perfect? No. 
but it is the industry's first contact to close platform, from first contact to cash in one place, from CRM to transaction management. Nobody else has built this or is even trying to. And with the Fed chair coming in and cutting off investment from our industry, we have turned a 10-year advantage into a 13-year advantage. That's where we are right now. Now, is, is it an easy time? No. <laughs> but it's time to bounce back. The company isn't the stock. The stock isn't the company. If I were going to ask you, is it possible that any company, much less ours, could have a third of its customers, in our case agents, invested in a stock that goes from 20 to 2, while the entire competitor environment, all of the real estate media apparatus is trying to take the company down every single day, and they still survive that? I would say no, but we're still here, and we're still strong. <laughs> This isn't easy for me, just like I know it's not easy for you. But I'm fortunate that we have each other. It makes me feel good to be with the best entrepreneurs in the country, people that have been through many cycles before and know how to bounce back with passion. I just traveled to over 100 different offices to meet with you in the last two months, four and a half days a week away from my family, flying coach every flight, because I don't want the luxury to go to me. I want to, the money to go to you and the company we're building. I am all in. I'm not checking out, I am checking in. My entire net worth is in this company. I still call every employee and every principal agent on their first day to welcome them to Compass. because I want you to know that I value you, that you are appreciated here as your authentic self, just as you are. Again, I know it's not easy, but I'm gonna be with you every step of the way. If any of you ever wanna talk, just text me, 917-488-4898. <laughs> I wanna be as entrepreneurial for you as you are for your clients. I wanna work as hard for you as you work for your clients. That's my bar. And so to close, I want to share where I think we are in the timeline of Compass. I want to compare it to the hardest thing that I ever ended up doing. Running 50 marathons, one in each US state to raise a million dollars for nonprofits. My mom come in almost every one. <laughs> that first marathon felt great. It was like a startup. Marathon one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten. Felt so amazing. But then, eleven. <laughs> Twelve. Thirteen. Fourteen. Fifteen. Sixteen. Seventeen. Eighteen. Nineteen. Twenty. Uh, Twenty-one. Twenty-two. Twenty-three. Twenty-four. Twenty-five. We're halfway there. But I gotta tell you, 26 to 40 is a long, boring haul. There's no excitement. <laughs> I think that the IPO was Marathon 25. And I think right now, we're around Marathon 30. So then you have 31, 32, 33, 34, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. But then when you get to 40, it starts feeling really good. 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50 is euphoric. We will have that moment together. <laughs> and I will be with you every step of the way. And here is what that moment is going to feel like. We will have delivered on the North Star. Anything an agent needs, Compass provides. We will have 
realize the promise of technology. It'll be Apple easy and Google fast. <laughs> and you will never have to write the same thing more than once. Mm. Your clients will come up to you every week, maybe even every day, and say, you at Compass, you improved the experience so much, I don't even remember what life was like before. Mm. And our stock, come on, it's gonna go from two to 20 and well beyond. Many companies have gone from two to 20, why not us? The, <laughs> The book will be from two to 20, how a group of 30,000 entrepreneurs banded together to improve an industry. And where will we be located? Of course, all the major cities in the US, but not just there. We will be in London, <laughs> Hong Kong, Singapore, Dubai, and Sao Paulo. <laughs> And I promise you, on our 20th anniversary, I will be on this stage still working for you. Yes, we'll have a little more gray hair, a few more wrinkles, but we will have a lot more pride in the company that we have built together, the future of real estate. Thank you, Compass. <laughs>